Welcome to Diversity Conversations, where we engage in thought-provoking dialogue to identify leadership solutions to today's most challenging conflicts. Stream live each week, Saturday, 9.30 a.m. to 11 a.m., hosted by diversity, equity, and inclusion strategist and CEOs Eric Ellis and Tommy Lewis. Join us and add your voice to this engaging diversity conversation. Good morning, Greater Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky, the United States, and the world. My name is Eric Ellis, and I'm the president and CEO of Integrity Development Corporation. And I'm joined this morning by my good friend and brother, Tommy Lewis, president and CEO of Make It Plain Consulting. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, Tommy, man. How was your week? Uh, week is good, Eric. It was uh, uneventful, uneventful. Okay. You know, we doing a lot of, uh, again, administrative work, and so it's just at the computer, you know, really delivering the goods, if you will. Uh, but uh, on, on a personal night, note, was able to get some rest and relaxation. Uh, and I'm I'm overly excited for whatever reason, Eric, to, to talk with you and be with you and our community this morning. Uh, well, I, I'm glad to hear that, Tommy. I feel the same way, man. Excited for our uh, conversation today. For those in our community that are joining us, we will be talking about strategies for reducing conflict in families. And I think that that's always a timely topic. Uh, this week for me, Tommy, I uh, was working with a client and I had the chance to do something that I hadn't done in a number of years is conduct some fish bowls. Right in the middle of a, like a diversity council meeting, I, uh, I knew that they were kind of struggling with some of the things that were happening within the organization. So I put together three fish bowls and asked volunteers to join us. The first one was with African-Americans on the council. The second one was, was with the white males on the council. And the third was with women and then intersectionality. And uh, powerful, Tommy. These uh, fish bowls were powerful. For those that might not be familiar with fish bowls, it's an opportunity for you to bring people together that are in the same sort of demographic and have them sort of form a circle and everybody that's not part of that group is sitting on the outs, outer circle and they're sort of watching people like we watch fish in a fish bowl. And the African-Americans started talking about what it's like to be African-American in this country today, what it's like to be African-American or black within that company. Uh, and uh, it was powerful, man. Uh, there, uh, there was a, a mother that shared that she's just so discouraged by the times that we're living in. She thought we would have been further along. They were coming back from the South and uh, they went through a family reunion, you know, had about four or five cars. They went into a gas station. And then when they came out uh, of the restroom, the woman pointed them to the back door, like go out the back door. Don't go out of our front door. And she said they couldn't believe that they were that that was a request. And she said her children start asking about it. And then she just burst into tears. Like, I just hate that my kids had to kind of see this unfold. Uh, and uh, and then the white males uh, fishbowl was really interesting. And uh, many of them were talking about what it's like to be a white male that's on the diversity council. And they're sort of typical white guys. And so they're catching a lot of grief in their community within the organization. Like, what are you doing being a part of that? Almost like you're a sellout, you know, and it was uh, very interesting. And then the women's panel, uh, you know, we had people that are part of the LGBTQ uh, Q community that were part of that panel as well, man. And just tears talking about, you know, what it feels like sometimes to feel like you're on an island by yourself. Uh, you know, a woman, you come into work, uh, you know, uh, they, they scrutinize your dress and everything. So. It was just powerful, man, to uh, I think that if people are ever going to be interested in managing their biases, uh, having empathy for one another, they need to know each other's stories. We need to know what we're going through. And I think that that can help to build greater empathy. Uh, the other thing that we're doing is we're doing a, an executive search again for one of our clients. And I love inviting the staff, the board to sort of uh, encourage candidates to, you know, that they're familiar with to apply for the position. Uh, the challenge is though, that oftentimes people can't let it go. You know, they, they recommend somebody, then they want to lobby for them the whole way and mm -hmm. at gunpoint, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, that can become a challenge. Uh, and uh, so, uh, Tommy, I love what we do. Uh, I'm grateful that uh, for the work that you and I get to do and, uh, and looking forward to the, the future in that work. 
let's talk about this uh, this topic, Tommy. Uh, and I'm going to open up with just sort of as I did some research on the top five reasons uh, people experience conflict within their families. These are the five things that came forward. Uh, communication issues, differences in values and beliefs. Sometimes financial disagreements can create conflict for people. Uh, for children, sometimes sibling rivalry is uh, it can be a problem not only as children, but even up into adulthood. And then conflict over roles and responsibilities. Tommy, why is it important for us in the midst of this diversity conversations to to be focused on and talking about strategies for trying to reduce conflict uh, within families? So for the most part, Eric, uh, all of our core beliefs and values come from our families, our immediate educational ecosystem, right? At first, it was our mother that we were birthed from, all human beings. And then if we had a father uh, that was present or not, we did have a father in one way, shape, or form. <clears throat> Again, we may have siblings. Uh, we may have uh, uncles, aunts, and other family members. And so from our beginnings, particularly through those first three to five to seven years, uh, we were being educated as if we were a piggy, a piggy bank, and these values were being deposited into our bank. How we see the world, how we engage with other people, how we deal with conflict how we communicate, right? Uh, all of that was being informed. Uh, we were being informed by all of those experiences. And so uh, that's our, those are our core beliefs and then they can be reinforced over the years or we can have events and experiences that challenge those core events. So as we become more uh, you know, discernible adults, we need to ask the, ask the question, you know, where did this come from? Where did my thinking come from? Mm -hmm. Where did my beliefs come from? We can track it back to those five reasons and why uh, it, it, it came from our families. Right. And I would say that, uh, uh, you know, I've got, uh, so my oldest brother, uh, Duke, uh, died three years ago. Uh, he had a son uh, that was outside of his marriage who is now 20. We met him four years ago. Uh, but still had never really spent much time. But he got connected up with my children, man, and they're just having a ball. So he came and he stayed with us this entire summer. And it was uh, just wild to see how much he valued family. I mean, he was just so glad to be able to call me uncle. Hey, um, you know, uh, da, 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 you know, he came here, got a job right away. And I could see that family was so important to him that he wanted to sort of avoid any of the little skirmishes that may happen across other family members. Uh, because he's like, hey, I'm, I ain't messing up this. I, I, I like a big family. I like being a part of family. And I wanna hold on to all these relationships, even if you all may be challenged between each other. And so that was kind of impressive to watch. Uh, let's talk about the first one, Tommy, uh, communication. Uh, strategies to uh, for managing and reducing conflict within families. Uh, so it's important to, uh, to encourage open and honest communication, uh, actively listening to each other's perspective and feelings, addressing misunderstandings promptly and respectfully. Tommy, what are your thoughts about the importance of communication as a strategy to reduce conflict? Eric, when we when we're talking about strategies of reducing conflict within families and this concept of communication i would say that we have to have the mindset and the heart of love mm. in that communication wow and the reason why is because when we communicate through love right yes it really elevates the kind of the reason the purpose mm. Mm. of the communication right and again the purpose is not to hurt it's not to harm it's not to victimize whoever we're talking to within the family regardless of the event 
which generates that energy. Mm -hmm. But when we begin to communicate either what, how the event or conversation is impacting us, our feelings, our thoughts, if we begin first with true love, then it begins to reduce the conflict and we can work through the conflict faster when the common denominator is love. I think it's powerful, Tommy. Uh, and uh, my prayer, uh, wish and prayer would be that more people would embrace that. My experience is that sometimes in families that can be a, ch a challenge. Yeah. Uh, you know, you just assume that love undergirds this thing and then you sort of go for what you know. I, I know that the family that I grew up in was a family that was oriented towards debate and competitive conversation. We were always jousting, you know, intellectual jousting. And uh, when I uh, uh, met Judy and we got married, uh, I thought that was going to be so enjoyable to be able to debate because she's got a great mind. And she was like, I don't know what kind of dysfunctional family you grew up with, but I got to take you off the communication training because that ain't right. Mm -hmm. And literally, I learned the skill of empathic listening wow. and uh, have been working on that uh, from the time that we got married uh, some 34 years ago to today. And so uh, love is kind of something that we assume is there. We hope that it's enough, uh, but oftentimes our family patterns that we grew up with can interrupt our ability to focus on love. Yeah, yeah, Eric, I absolutely agree. I think, uh, you know, both of our perspectives and our lived experiences converge into effective communication. Right. That is, yeah. That, so. So there is love and sometimes it's just a four letter word. And sometimes it's a real deep feeling in the course of conflict. Uh, I have found myself, particularly with my wife, there's some conversations that we have that I completely disagree with. Mm -hmm. And actually the feedback and comments that are made to me are not only offensive in my mind, but they're hurtful. Mm -hmm. And when I feel hurt, I get defensive. Right. And if I get overly defensive, I get angry. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. And then I lock in. Right. So we're talking about this intellectual debate. Let's go in. Right. Because now you are attacking mm -hmm. my person. Right. You're attacking my value system. Mm hmm. If you talk about my siblings, if you talk about my son, if you talk about any of that, I want to come back at you. Right. And I've learned after the explosive conversation, mm -hmm. right? It just gets out of control mm -hmm. for both of us. The, the healing after those explosions, and we've healed, it's it's come down to the common uh, denominator that she does love me. Right. It, 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 it is out of love, Eric. Right. right. And I am too. So I've had to fight through some of my other stuff when I wasn't feeling love, when I wasn't hearing love. But when I settled down and listened, this is out of love. Right. So now I can I can disagree. I may not accept. I don't want to come back and return communications of hurt, harm, and hate. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what's helped me reduce the conflict. I don't have to keep igniting that flame yeah. Yeah. explosion. No, just it blows up. Hey, I told you, Tommy, stop doing that. Oh, okay. I, I know you're right about it. Right. 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 Sure. I don't have to get in that at that level. I don't have to get in it. I can just receive it and yep. shut this down. I was uh, I was looking at I was thinking about the thing that has interrupted uh, or or sort of taking my communication in the wrong direction. Oftentimes, Tommy, it's pride. It's pride. 
Uh, you said something to me the wrong way. Uh, I, actually, I don't even let guys talk to me like that. Uh, or I think I'm so right about something and it's hard for my brain to see the other perspective. So I, I started thinking about egocentrism. And then I, I started looking that up because I said, wow, I said that's 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 one of the things that can get in the way is our pride. But egocentrism, it, it is an inability to accurately understand any perspective other than one's own. Although egocentrism and, and narcissism uh, appear similar, they're different. It is a cognitive bias and refers to the natural restriction of our perception caused by the simple fact that we can only see the world from our point of view. And uh, that's what gets us trapped, Tommy, is egocentrism in our brain honestly only being able to see the world from our perspective, which we then assume is the right and correct perspective. Uh, they were talking about little children can't really do a good job of perspective taking until they get past the age of eight. So after eight, then you should be able to not just know your perspective of the world, but also be able to understand other people's perspectives. Little kids aren't good at playing checkers and chess. Right. Because to do that, you have to actually be able to do to see their perspective, not assume that their perspective is your perspective. And so chess and checkers can be things that can help us to get better at this. But, Tommy, I find that uh, it can be difficult for any of us in the world to be willing to be open to the fact that my perspective may not be right. Eric. Many of us are familiar with Deepak Chopra. I would like to invite our listening audience and our community to uh, revisit living without ego. Mm. Living without ego. It's a journey. Right. So it's not just read a book, watch a video, uh, and all of a sudden, oh, I am without ego. Right. It is a journey. I will agree with you again that you're spot on, right? And right. as you were sharing, Eric, uh, I was just thinking, I was thinking two thoughts personally. One is that uh, I have a sister and we never argue at all, ever. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about back in the day when we were living in the same room in our home, right? We had a, a bunch of folks in the house, so we had to have two to a room in my our oldest sister, she had her own room, right? Mm -hmm. But me and Anita, right? We, we were bumped up together. And she's a few years older than I am. And we used to, you know, bump heads every now and again because it was just about space. It right, wasn't right. Okay, right. So you just cross that little line. It's all carpet, but you got to draw that line in the carpet, <laughs> cross the carpet, right? And now I got to, you know, I got to go run and tell mom because I was, mom, you know, Anita. We got older. I'm, I'm talking about teenage years now. We're older. And we stopped arguing. Mm. We don't, we never argue. I think one of the reasons why we do not argue at all, there is no ego involved in our relationship, mm. in our communication, in our love for one another and we have given each other some critical feedback mm -hmm. right uh, welcome and invited and then unsolicited feedback mm -hmm. and so when you when you're talking about that egocentrism it resonated with me yeah seeing the world through our own lenses and uh, and finding it difficult. So I, I love what you said about uh, you all not having any ego with each other, because I think that that's what gets in the way. It's sometimes, Tommy, our hurts that we had growing up. It's uh, question marks that we have in our own brain. And we're wondering if the world sees us that way. Mm -hmm. I'm ADHD. As a child, I did not like reading. 
I was easily distracted. Mm -hmm. And so there were times when I didn't think I was smart at all. And that was the fear I had because I don't like reading right now. You know, I didn't realize that I would one day love reading the things that I'm interested in. Yeah. Uh, but but I have the so I have a squishy spot then around intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so if anybody sort of challenges that I take the fight when there's no need to. But the reason why I'm taking the fight is I'm still in elementary school. I'm still counting to see how many people before I have to read. And then what passage am I going to have to read? Let me see if I can rehearse that a little bit now because I don't want to embarrass myself in front of others because I'm reading. I get distracted and then I lost my place. Yeah. But those are battles, Tommy, that we are still fighting. And sometimes they come out in our communication. I'm going to say this, that as God begins to heal us. And as we get counseling or we get learning a reinforcement from other positive people that that thing that we thought was true about ourselves is not true, then I think that we're in a healthier place where we no longer have to fight other people over it. Because really the battle is we're fighting ourselves. We're already lowballing ourselves. And we do need healing from that. If we don't get that healing, we'll constantly be fighting somebody else like it's their problem when sometimes it's not. You're spot on. As Lydia says, Eric, she calls it the uh, inner critic. Mm -hmm. that, that's what it is. Uh, that's spot on. Right. Right. And the ego, the inner critic. In a sense, is one perceiving the problems, flaws, etc. It may not even be true. Most right. often it's not. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, you know, we we hear that communication. We, we don't only hear what uh, verbally what we're hearing, but we also hear the nonverbals. That's in our head. Right. But yeah, that's our own. We're meaning. adding meaning to that. Yes. We're adding you made meaning. a smirk, but I added the meaning. That's it. And then that meaning, that meaning that we are creating generates some energy in us. Yeah. All right. What 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 you say? Right. I, no, I just said that. Uh, you promised uh, oh i did promise right and i got all mad because you reminded me that i promised right <laughs> man it can be a vicious cycle boy absolutely let's continue on uh the next uh sort of strategy uh has to do with our values and beliefs so one of the big uh areas of challenge for people is in differences around our values and beliefs uh, focusing on understanding and respecting each other's values and beliefs, finding common ground in areas of compromise, engaging in constructive discussions rather than trying to change each other's uh, perspective. What are the conflicts that you see arise uh, in families around values and beliefs? So I want to say two things here, Eric. Uh, one is that uh, I would love for our community who has maybe has more experience than I do with regards to either functional or dysfunctional families. Mm -hmm. I would like to admit that my nuclear family, in my mind, based on where I am now reflecting back some many decades, mm -hmm. we had a pretty functional family, mm -hmm. right? We did. Now, there was some dysfunction. Right. Obviously. But it wasn't to a point where other people would say it's dysfunctional. Right. Right. They would literally say, that's what that's family good. is. Right. And I say that because I have found myself witnessing other families interacting. And yeah. I have said, that is dysfunctional. Right. Right. That's problematic. Yeah. That's toxic. Yeah. The people in that family will come out saying, this is toxic. Right, right. right? And so I would love to invite our community members in that space. And I'm thinking right. the other piece is that when we think of values and beliefs, we have to unpack that. Mm -hmm. Because if we're talking about, quote unquote, dysfunctional family interactions and relations, the value system that they operate out of 
may be different than other families that identify themselves as being functional. Absolutely. Right. right? So it's just, this is how we talk. This is how we do. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's no problem with it. I, I just overheard a family, African American family, yesterday at dinner who they were loud enough for us to hear them for one right we we're sitting at a different table um they were using colorful language language that i'm not unfamiliar with they were cussing and fussing mm -hmm. right i thought differently like i don't know if this is the place and time right. for that type of volume and language but in any who uh and then a a bit of a heated discussion started to happen so much so that one family member had to get up and leave so i didn't know i didn't know what was the belief mm -hmm. around that family mm -hmm. such that the discussion became a conflict and the conflict was driving some behavior mm -hmm. and so as i put a bow around my comments around this values and beliefs um i do think that it's both individual values and beliefs and it's collective values mm. and beliefs right and there may be at times a collision right between that individual belief and the collective belief that creates that conflict right I, I agree with that Tommy uh and I will never forget looking back on it now it's kind of wow but I'm going to tie together this second one around values and beliefs and the first one so when Judy and I were getting ready to get married, I had made an assumption. I never thought about it, actually, that mm -hmm. she would just take my last name. Never even thought about it. Yeah. And then she said, uh, well, I'm not sure, you know, what name I want to take. <laughs> huh? Well, you don't love me? Now, look, Tommy, my brain, egocentrism could only see that conflict from my worldview that everybody I know has always the wife took the name of the husband so much so that I never even considered that there was another option and literally Tommy that stalled us for a minute oh. and we were at a stalemate man we weren't finishing that up in one conversation uh and then finally, Tommy, I had, I mean, God had to wrestle me down to if you love this woman the way you say, then this has got to become a non-issue for you. Ooh. And I was like, what? And so then I went back and I said, Judy, look, Tommy, I finally thought it through. God gave me that, but then he gave me an example of if you've been Eric Ellis all of your life and now you're Eric Baldwin, what would that do to your identity? I said, yeah. I put a lot of years of investment into Eric Ellis. I'm, you know, 28 years. Yeah. I, I'm not going easily. And I, as soon as I saw it that way, Tommy, perspective, I was able to go back to her and say, hey, Judy, I'm fine with that. And she said, I'll take your name. Mm -hmm. Huh? After all that, <laughs> why do we have to do? But it's just, uh, I mean, it's just our values and beliefs. At, at the wedding, I remember she, she joked about it to the kids a couple of days ago. I didn't believe in dancing. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I was in the world forever. And then I got into church and I was in a conservative church, the Church of God which didn't dance, you know, go to movies or anything. So I was like, no, we can't have no dancing at the uh, wedding, you know, da, da, da. Man, it was just crazy how your value systems can create conflict, especially if you tie in egocentrism and an unwillingness to see that there are other viable options that are legitimate. Eric, again, I want our community, let me be specific. I'm listening. I'm hearing. So I was going to say I want our community to really listen and kind of attach what we're talking about today in reducing conflict in families and really 
look at yourself. But I'm not going to do that because as you're talking about your family, your situation, man, I have a laundry list of situations <laughs> in my own family, even currently. Right. You, you talked about different belief systems, right? From even religious belief yeah. systems. Yes. Like in my family, as I have a blended married family, right? My family that's sprinkled through marriages, my wife's family that's sprinkled through marriages. We have different religions. Some people don't even practice religion. Right. They're atheists or agnostic. Yeah. yeah. And so there are certain conversations that we have or don't have. That's right. Wisely right? don't have wisely don't have based on values and beliefs right. so if we were to get into this discussion around this value belief it will blow up right because folks will why folks will really dig in right right dig in and i just know i, I have brother-in-law sister-in-laws uh and and they run their own families mm -hmm. i have had to learn through experience and now wisdom right. that I manage my home and my family right. to reduce stress, mm. to reduce conflict. Eric, I used to be, uh, why? Yeah, why? jumping on every issue. Yeah. Every little train that came by, you had to test it out. I had to test it out. Folks, you can come over to the house, we can talk about nothing, right? My value system, Eric, is to talk about something that's uplifting. Right. My mind is, when we have these conversations, once we move beyond how was your weekend, what's the weather, what's the professional football teams doing, once we move beyond that surface stuff, I do want to build, right? Time out. It's been 14, 15 years and i have not had a building conversation so tommy dismount i've had to i'm out okay abort 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 eric abort good grief get in the capsule and jettison into space right right and be comfortable floating in the conversation right. never landing right never never thrusting into a particular direction just go with the flow that is from understanding communication understanding true beliefs and values to reduce the conflict in the family right and a lot of people don't want to get there but at a certain point you have to get there let's see what they said that's i think we think it speak is a belief that's the reason a lot of value to know ourselves and explore our own belief systems. I totally agree with that. A lot of times we are not putting our own belief systems on trial. We are uh, we are literally putting other people's beliefs. I'd love for Terry uh, Cooley to weigh in too. Terry, if you're here with us, Terry comes from a large family mm -hmm. and just looking at strategies that they uh, incorporated uh, when he was young to sort of keep the conflict down. And then, uh, you know, strategies that he's worked on today. Uh, as I think about, uh, you know, sort of values and beliefs, it's interesting, you know, things like in the household, uh, my wife might, she doesn't want to uh, close in the uh, hallway, but don't matter if they stack all up in the closet. So this is a value over here. This ain't, you know, they don't have to line up. And it's interesting how they can uh, uh, impact our relationship. Uh Let's see, uh, quiet time uh, together at home versus going out to a nice restaurant. Those are values and beliefs. Each can be legitimate. But if I only define success and right as the one that I value and I don't see the one that you value, then we're going to have conflict. I know that what we watch on TV, I've literally just turned over the remote for the most part in the room. I know that's Judy's domain, so... Now I just try to negotiate. Can we can we think about this every once in a while? Do I have to watch the Housewives of Atlanta 
and the Housewives of L.A. And you know, but she's gonna kill me. I'm so glad she's not gonna be watching this. <laughs> and once I should tune in, man, I'll be yeah, I'm gonna get in trouble. She might be texting me right now. How you gonna put me out there like that? Right now, and, it, and it sounds like this on my end, Eric. Uh, Tommy, I'm not gonna be able to go golf this weekend. What? What did you do? <laughs> right. <laughs> So, but these values and belief questions, and I think that the older we get, Tommy, we stop taking the de debate. We stop taking the debate, and we realize that we don't have to react to everything, and everybody has the right to their own values and beliefs. And I don't need you to line up exactly with mine. You know, I'm gonna make complete freedom for you. Let's look at the next one. Financial disagreements, Tommy. Sometimes our uh, conflict, it's one of the number one reasons why people get divorced, is uh, is financial disagreements. How do you navigate that? How do you ensure that that doesn't sort of overshadow everything else in relationships? It's difficult, Eric. Yeah. Um, again, uh, our financial value system uh, comes from our upbringing, uh, the information that we are privy to uh, with regards to finances, and then sometimes what we don't know about finances. So oftentimes the things that we don't know really create those issues. And let me give you an example. If we don't really know how money works, right? right? and what savings looks like, what spending looks like, what investments, and not just you know the, the Wall Street investments, but simply investing into property, your home or apartment, furniture, et cetera. Uh, you can buy less expensive furniture, i.e. cheap furniture, and have to replace that furniture right. in a shorter time. So now you're just spending money. Those are bad investments. Mm -hmm. But when our, our value system is based on finance and lack thereof, when we're engaging with another person that may have a different value system or perspective of finance, they just value money differently. It will cause disagreements, right? And then if there's some ideal about who's the breadwinner and yeah. What does that look like? If I am the breadwinner, then I can kind of do with my money what I would like to do with it. Oh, we. Right? Woo! Hold on, hold on. We are we. We're right. married. It's right. us. We're right. together. I understand that. I did take care of my, you know, my financial responsibilities. If I'm responsible for the mortgage or the rent, maybe the utilities, et cetera, et cetera. But if there's anything extra that I have worked for, I can do and will do with it whatever I want. Yeah. You're spending too much time at the bars. My money. Mm -hmm. You're spending too much time with your extracurricular. My money. Mm -hmm. You're spending. Now we have a conflict. And when, because it will happen, Eric when the financial responsibilities are not taken care of but the extracurricular activities are still being taken care of now you have an explosion in the home absolutely man absolutely and so that's all coming from some you know miscommunication values and beliefs and we get to the financial disagreement is uh and sometimes it's even assumptions i assume that when we were going to get married uh, you were going to pay for all that. Right? I didn't say that. You, you're just a kept person. And oftentimes, it's, you're a kept woman. Mm. right? What do you mean? Yeah, you just want me to keep you. right? You need to bring some add value. And then they come back with, well, I take care of the kids. I take care of the cleanliness of the house. Right? But I'm out here hunting for this money. Right. right? So now we have a vicious cycle that it's never a one-time conversation. No, no, we're gonna come back to that one a lot. And I'll tell you, Tommy, uh, one of the biggest ones that I've seen 
is uh, especially women of color, but women in general that are financially more successful than their husband. Men are pathetic at, I, I've, 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 I've observed women having to do so much ego stroking of men who are insecure because their wife has a, a powerful position or brings in more money than they do. Now, when I see them in a workshop, the guys will tell me, I just wish I would. If she's making more money than me, I'll stay at home. I'll be the house. No, you won't. You, you won't do that unless you can't get a job. And then you'll complain the whole way and won't take on any responsibilities in the house as well. So I find this financial disagreement, Tommy, is something that people have to be mindful of. It's a character issue. I know I had Judy and I both had more energy to fight about it when we were younger. Uh, the fact that we survived through it, uh, we now almost never really argue at all about money. Uh, we've kind of got our own rhythm around it. There are some things that if I would have listened to her a while ago, we'd even be in a stronger position. So there's some things that you see in hindsight. Uh, but uh, but I'm grateful that we found a way to get over that. And I mean, she's got a big giant job. I don't get to see or ask about her money. You know, my yeah. money is our money. You know, her money is her money. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I'm I'm uh, totally uh, okay with that. And I'm grateful that she doesn't uh, put a heavy hand on scrutinizing what I do. We know we have some mutual goals that we're trying to achieve. But I can tell you, man, financial disagreements can can rock relationships and families to the core let's look I'll, at I'll, I'll add real quick eric because yeah. we're talking about strategies for reducing conflict in families and this is the topic around financial disagreements i will add this one way to reduce that conflict is to do two things initially and many many more things first it's always communication yeah right so early on in your engagement with another person if there are any plans of coming together mutually through marriage through children etc to communicate what your ideal is with money how do you see money and to actively listen to the other person don't defend your perspective mm. don't attack the other person based on their perception and value of money, but to really understand their stuff. That's one, communication. Two, through that communication, Eric, accept your responsibility within the financial agreement communication. Mm -hmm. For example, if you accept paying the bills, accept it and just do that. Whatever those bills are, pay it, right? And don't acquiesce, right? You may get to a point that you are unable to pay bills, then you have to pivot, and then you pivot back. If it's vacations, if it's whatever the case may be. But you have to accept it. Here's what I've learned for me to put a bow around my story here. For me and my marriage, Eric, I am actually getting out of it exactly what I told myself many moons ago. When I was a child, I wanted to be the man. I saw my father doing what he was doing. I saw right. my mama playing her role, and I wanted to be the man. Right. And my father would tell me every now and again, he said, "Boy, you, I got you. I got you the best baseball glove, the base, the best football gear. You know, you got this. You know, I'm working hard to put this on you." Thanks, Dad. I was, you know, I was very gracious. And I thought, when I when I'm the man of my household, right. I'm gonna be able to do that. I'll right. take care of the bills, I'll take care of it. Be careful what you ask for. Right. So now my wife continues to get degree after degree after degree after degree. I value education. She's always in school. She uh -huh. just finished her second master's degree in another field that she's going to go into right why is there a reduction of conflict eric full transparency 
I'm okay with my wife not working, pursuing her dreams because she articulated to me what her dream was. She wants to help people. Mm -hmm. Eric, that's my dream. That's what I live out every day. I help people. I help individuals. And I'm saying, hold on, Penny. Hold on. I, let's put together a plan. Get your master's degree, your PhD. Start your own business. Right. We will have a, a, a standalone building. You can run your counseling and therapy business in the other wing therefore the finances are all funneling, funneling down into the same pot of gold mm -hmm. eric i'm not a terrible saver i don't save well at all right 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 I, right i spend yeah i get I know something about that as well <laughs> yep yep and so stuff gets loose right right but my wife, four years in school, she's always able to take care of her own bills. Mm -hmm. And then she gets a job for two or two or three years, hmm. goes into school for four years. And I'm scratching my head. How are you doing all that? Right. How are you able to do it? She's a saver and right. a planner. Mm -hmm. I'm a planner and a spender. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the plan is make money financially be comfortable we don't have to be terribly wealthy sure we'll drop a couple of dollars to try to win 1.55 billion dollars. right I, I got on that one i only played a lot of but i got on that one yeah we, we just throw the name in the hat right but ultimately it's that communication and understanding what's our roles and responsibilities what is our agreement and then we have what we call the batna the best alternative to the negotiated agreement mm -hmm. The agreement financially have a home the best alternative in this season tommy you're responsible in this season it may be a downturn in business penny you have to raise up mm -hmm. penny goes to school tommy you raise up hey best alternative to the negotiated agreement of happiness peace low conflict but financially stable to the best of our potential Right. You, you introduced it at the very top of the conversation, Tommy, when you said love is a major ingredient to make this happen. Because without that, we just go for broke. Everybody only goes from their egocentric worldview and we're just constantly fighting. Uh, let's look at what Terry said, because, you know, just ask Terry to weigh in about families and how do you, you know, strategies to minimize conflict. He said, uh, I learned that in this journey of life, there are many roads that you can uh, get to where you uh, want to go. Uh, the same with people. Everyone has their own opinion. The truth lies somewhere in it all. Yeah. Uh, and I've seen Terry operate like that uh, with, with, with kindness, with humility, with questions. He like uses almost like the Socratic method of, 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 of getting people to get insight. He's one of the wisest questioners that I've seen where he won't tell, uh, you know, even the children that he's raising, he's a foster dad, he'll ask questions. And then asking questions causes people to get their own revelation. And uh, when children think they, they're the boss of everything and got it, he said, well, go ahead, we'll speak up. Let's see what you got to say, you know. And then sort of it helps to balance people. But that notion of this is a journey, the truth lies somewhere in it all is part of what we have to do especially when we're most energized to argue and debate our perspective that's when we have to say no my perspective is not the only and right perspective the truth is somewhere in this and so if i keep drilling mine that means i'm probably missing a part of the answer because i'm not hearing or trying to validate or value some of what the other person's saying I want to add as we before we move to the next topic, Eric, that this is not financial disagreements. This is not just between the adults, be it dating, married, et cetera. Uh, I was working with a young man in coaching just a few days ago, and he was mentioning that um, his son, a young teenage son, uh, that they had been apart for some time, uh, had 
literally have been calling his father over the last couple of years uh, because of the distance, simply asking for money. Yeah. And so in other words, the, the teenage son was attaching his view of his father's love for him based on the amount of money he was giving. So the son says, I need $200 to get some shoes and do some things. Father says, son, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't have it. Son says, you don't love me. Right. To minimize and reduce the conflict, the father who was standing on truth, the truth was, I don't have an extra $200 to give you. The other truth is, I have been paying $1,500 a month in child support. The son doesn't see that. Right. Right. The son just benefits from having a house, having some food, having some clothing. He doesn't see the $1,500. Right. So, again, when we're looking at conflicts in families where it can be siblings, it could be dependents saying, hey, this money deal is a deal breaker. We need to have a conversation. Right. right. Again, even amongst siblings. Right. And so sibling rivalry, uh, fostering a sense of equality and fairness among siblings, encourage cooperation and teamwork instead of competition, allocate responsibilities and privileges fairly. Uh, I know that as I was growing up, my father set up competition. Me and my older brother, we we played against each other. We competed against each other on a regular, you know. And so that stayed with us. And kids are constantly, whether they say it out loud, they're constantly judging uh, how they feel about each other based upon how their parents are perceived as treating the others. And so uh, how do you manage making sure that every child knows that they are loved when in fact some may be easier to engage and interact with than others eric you you have to truly know your children as a parent our children are different right they are parts of us right. mom and dad but they're different and sometimes, oftentimes, we see our children through our own lens. Right. It's what we did, right. what we were exposed to, what right. lessons that we learn in life that brought us to the point that we are now in a state of wisdom. And we want to kind of expedite that process toward wisdom mm -hmm. for our children. In other words, we said, hey, here are the pitfalls along the road that T. Cooley was talking about, many different roads. Here are the pitfalls in that role and we're just we're throwing that blanket statement in direction to all of our children mm -hmm. one child is saying why are you telling me this i uh i always pay attention to pitfalls right you're up the other child is saying what were you talking to me right i'm not even listening dad right and so when we the, to reduce sibling rivalry it's coming from the adults initially, coming from the adults in the space. They, the adults, generate the culture of the, the family. What do the what are the children exposed to? Right? Uh, what are they not exposed to? So my my mother, she was she worked in healthcare for 30 plus years easily mm -hmm. right? so anything that had to do with the human body uh she had a scientific explanation for it, okay right if it had anything to do with sex there's a science behind it right if it had anything to do with pain there was a science behind it if it had anything to do with anything it, there was a science about the body mm -hmm. because she saw bodies intact and opened up mm -hmm. I was interested in that, the science. I had one sister, could not care less. Right, right. And so what I would say to my other sister, she, she was, who was older, I would say, Diane, you need to pay attention to this. Right. 
little boy. Right. I told her, I don't have to pay attention to this. She's mama's talking to you. Right. And and then a little rivalry started to bubble. Right. I pay attention to mom and dad. You don't. My right. sister would say, the mom and dad that I know is different than the mom and dad you know. Mm. Because I'm 12 years older than you, boy. Right. Right. And so understanding, you know, mm. sibling rivalry can be from both the parents down and bubble up from within. Right. Right. I'm gonna give you a touchy area, Tommy. The touchy area is how should parents talk to one child about the others? And I think that that's a fine, there's a fine line in there, Tommy. It would be easy to say. And so the rule that I would choose on automatic is don't do it. Parents don't talk to one kid about, about the other. But in reality, sometimes your children may even need to talk about the other and the relationship or lack of relationship that they have. Judy and I slightly differ, just slightly. But uh, I just don't, I want to be able to say something about them that even if they were here, I would be willing to kind of say that. Uh, I am never joining in sort of piling up with one kid on another. But now, Tommy, I'm going to tell you, man, this is an imperfect science. And sometimes if you let your guard down, you can do some things that aren't uh, recommended. Uh, and I think that if we if we if we engage in that, uh, it can be to the harm of their relationship and ultimately our relationship with each other. Now, what I encourage my children to do is that I said, I believe, so I want you to be able to bring anything you have a problem with me to me. But if you don't feel like you can, and you need to just go tell your mother, talk, go to your mother, talk about me, I'm okay with that. I want to let you know that I know that you love me. And because I already know that, the fact that you have to go to your mother to get some sanity around some things that I may have done, I encourage that. I think that that's healthy because I think that we have to understand that part of it is we are human beings and what human beings do is they talk. Yep. Yep. I'm trying to encourage us not to say things that are harmful about each other, but utilize the talk in more constructive, productive ways. It doesn't always work out that way, but that's my thinking on my recommendation generally. It has to come from a deep core well of love. It does, Eric, because the emotions get involved, our mindsets get involved, our perspectives, how we see the same conversation, how we see the same event, they vary, right? And we can lose sight, although we're seeing the event. We're experiencing the event. We can see the same thing from different perspectives and lose sight on do we love each other right. as siblings? Right. And when that common denominator continues to surface up, conflict is reduced. Right. Again, we have conflict. We have disagreements. We have fights. But the, the skill and the strategy is, is how do we reduce the time from event of frustration to healing? Right. And being able to move on. Because some of our siblings and families have never healed. Right. That's it, Tommy. They, they hold that trauma going into their adult age and in, 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 in ages. And uh, it shows up when you know you you are not invited to the family reunion you did not get the invite to the baby shower mm -hmm. you were not asked to come to the graduation and when you show up uninvited unannounced then i gotta give it to you brother literally not brother like being right you're my brother i gotta give it to you because i've been stewing on this yeah. for 50 years right right, right? If we are not allowing love to literally surface, are we looking at ourselves saying, for 50 years, I spent too much energy 
and trying to get back at my brother. Right. We can all have been in a better place if I would have thought and done something differently. We Absolutely. have to be wise to look at that going forward. Right. Absolutely. And Tommy, I would say recognize that everything in every relationship has moments and seasons. So I know with some of my children, I wasn't as good at, the, at this age as I am now at this age. You know, and so things go through season. If you just hang in there, you can get to a better season. The last one is roles and responsibilities. I think we talked about that, and we're out of time right now, Tommy. Tommy, this hour has flown by, and I really appreciate our conversation about strategies that all of us can employ to try to reduce the conflict uh, that happens within our families. Because what I would say is that there are some conflicts that are necessary and actually even productive. But when we get to dysfunctional and destructive con uh, conflicts, those are the things that we want to try to work on repairing. And I would say, and we certainly suggested it here, is that if you move away from egocentrism, then you will recognize that you have some growth and development and work that you need to do on yourself as well if we're going to bridge these conflicts more uh, uh, successfully. Tommy, say the final word and then we'll uh, call it a day. This is always an ongoing conversation, uh, strategies for reducing conflict in families. Uh, we have families for a reason. Some of them we've asked for, some of them we have not, but we all are family. And so as we look at this diversity conversation, we want you to go back into your respective families and communities and employ some of those more productive strategies. Until the next time, until our next installment of Diversity Conversations, please be blessed, be safe, and take care of each other. We'll see you soon. Take care. Bye now.